So here we are for our uh, second talk of the day by uh, Logan Shariker on dynamics in a detailed model of primary visual cortex. Thank you, Benjamin. And uh, thanks for inviting me and for all the organization put into the meeting. And uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, let me see if I can progress here. So <clears throat> what is this work about? Uh, I've been uh, working for some uh, time now on building a mechanistic model of a piece of the visual cortex. And <clears throat> one of the main reasons that we're trying to build a model of a piece of visual cortex is we want to take advantage of the large amount of experimental data on V1, in particular macaque V1 to constrain our model. Uh, the idea is that the more of V1 we can model and benchmark against data, the more confident we can become that it's capturing some aspects of the real brain. So uh, we want to use this model to test ideas for uh, how various visual functions arise. And we would like to try to gain some understanding of the important aspects of the uh, internal dynamics. Uh, that are uh, at play in, in um, visual functions. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, I have to add the disclaimer that the system is mathematically very difficult to analyze. So this is more computational work, um, although we are trying to approach it as systematically as we can. There are no theorems, like strong theorems here yet about this uh, the system that we're studying. But hopefully, uh, it's something that theorists will find interesting, uh, uh, something interesting in it to tackle. Um, so the goals of this talk are to introduce you to some of this, just some of the structure and function of, of V1. So some vision neuroscience 101. And also to, uh, I'd like to sh uh, show you a look inside the model and uh, uh, show you what kind of dynamics are at play while it responds to visual input to just give you a taste of how, of, of what's even at play in this, uh, in this system. Uh, also, uh, this work wouldn't have gone anywhere without any of these uh, collaborators. Uh, I work with Lai Sang Young and uh, Bob Shapley and Mike Hawken at NYU. Uh, Bob and Mike are uh, neuroscientists at, at CNS who uh, uh, our guides into to vision neuroscience, uh, neuroscience and uh, make sure we don't stray too far away from the biology. And there's many other people that uh, really should be mentioned uh, who have worked with them on uh, related um, work in the past that um, ultimately led up to, to projects like the one I'm working on now. And there's plenty of other grad students that worked on related things that are uh, uh, I wish I could mention as well. Uh, so <clears throat> let me jump into uh, uh, the uh, sort of background neuroscience here. Uh, so now for an introduction to the visual system. So light comes in through the eyes, uh, activates neurons in the retina, which has its own local network and does some uh, initial processing of the visual information. And then the retina sends that information to a a uh, bunch of cells in the middle of the head uh, at a location called the lat uh, lateral geniculate nucleus or LGN for short. So LGN for this talk can be thought of as a bunch of relay neurons that pass information uh, from the retina to the back of the head where the visual cortex is located. Uh, now there's a dramatic increase in the complexity and number of neurons once you get into cortex. Um, basic processing like edge and corner detection happens there, in addition to numerous other things. Um, and then that information moves on to higher and higher cortical er areas like V2 and MT and so on. Um, um, <clears throat> I should mention that there's multiple parallel pathways in the visual system. Uh, two of the big ones are called the magnocellular, magnocellular pathway and the parvocellular pathway. Uh, the one we're interested in uh, for our modeling efforts are the is the magnocellular pathway. Uh, so for the magno pathway, think of it as processing motion mainly, and parvo pa pathway 
being uh, responsible for processing color and identifying objects. It's a very, very uh, um, oversimplified, oversimplified view. Um, but uh, for this talk, you can uh, think of them that way. Um, so, uh, so we'll ignore the parvo pathway for this talk. Uh, so next, I'll need to talk about the retina topic map. Um, <clears throat> So we all know that light comes through and in through the eyes and uh, gets mapped by our lens onto a roughly 2D sheet of neurons in the back of the eye. So points in the visual field correspond to points along a roughly 2D grid of neurons. Uh, the, this concept actually continues on into V1, uh, or primary visual cortex in the back of the head, um, which can also be thought of as a slightly thickened 2D sheet of neurons uh, with locations on this uh, laterally along this sheet of neurons being mapped to points in your visual field. Um, <clears throat> neurons in V1 only see, so to speak, a small part of the visual field. So this concept of mapping uh, visual field to cortex still makes sense in V1 uh, in higher quarter, cortical areas that starts to make less sense as neurons start to process more and more. Uh, they take in uh, information from more and more of the visual field. Um, so this mapping from points in the visual field to cortex is called the retina topic map. Um, so here's a picture from an, ex, uh, an old experiment uh, demonstrating uh, this mapping in a piece of cortex. So here's here's uh, uh, an image that uh, a macaque uh, was shown, and uh, here's a uh, uh, here's where in the cortex. Uh, that, that I, um, this image had stimulated. Um, uh, so another important thing I should say about uh, visual cortex um, <clears throat> is that uh, it has a layered structure. So suppose we take a piece of uh, a visual cortex and, and look at it, we'll see that it's about two to three millimeters thick. And if you look at a cross section through it, uh, uh, and uh, look at it under a microscope and, and stain it, you'll see that uh, uh, it's uh, separated into several different uh, layers. Uh, so neuroscientists label these, uh, these layers uh, one through six, but they also, each of these layers also tends to get subdivided into um, sublayers as well. Um, so, uh, uh, so the, the Magno pathway, LGN pathway that we're interested in, um, it projects into one layer in particular, in particular a sublayer of layer four called uh, 4C alpha. Um, and it also makes some projections into, into layer six as well. Um, so uh, uh, I should say that... Uh, uh, yeah, of interest to us is layer four, in particular, 4C alpha. Uh, so this is the primary entry point of LGN into cortex. And uh, this will be the subject of our, our uh, modeling efforts, layer four in particular. Um, now, one of the most salient features of uh, neurons in V1 is that they tend to be selective for edges uh, of a certain orientation. So this figure, uh, demonstrates the output of a single neuron when shown uh, a bar of various orientations uh, being moved perpendicular to its long side uh, in the neuron's uh, area uh, uh, of the visual field that it responds to. Uh, so this particular neuron shown here responds strongly to uh, a vertical bar, you see, and then uh, uh, as the orientation of the bar rotates, it's, uh, it becomes less responsive to the movement of that bar. <clears throat> and uh, um, so if you, if you plot the response to various orientations, you get uh, a tuning curve here showing uh, that it has a preference for, for showing its preference for particular orientations. Um, now, a common... Uh, uh, type of stimulus uh, that's used in experiments is uh, uh, not only bars like this, but also uh, drifting gratings, which you can just uh, think of as uh, black and white bars that are all uh, moving in one direction. And this is a periodic stimulus. Um, 
<clears throat> so uh, now, uh, if you take a look in uh, Cortex, uh, so think of this image as uh, locations as in, of the, in this image as being uh, points along the cortical surface. And if you uh, uh, um, record from neurons there and find their uh, preferred orientation and mark uh, what it is, you get this uh, map shown here. Um, and uh, uh, so what you find is that orientation preference varies roughly continuously along the cortical surface, except that uh, some singularities like the ones uh, shown here. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, one feature of these uh, singularities is that they have all of the orientation preferences represented around them. So regions like this with all orientations represented around a singularity, these are called pinwheels or also hypercolumns. Um, so we can we can roughly divide, subdivide the cortical surface uh, into a sort of messy tiling of these pinwheels or hypercolumns. Um, okay. So now that I've shown uh, some of the basics of the visual pathway and the most basic features that V1 uh, computes, I can outline the construction of our model. So first we start with modeling the visual input, uh, which will uh, be in black and white. So there's no color here, since this is the magnocellular pathway. Um, and uh, um, So, uh, so this gets fed to the uh, LGN neurons in the model. Um, <clears throat> now we model a grid of LGN neurons, and uh, these respond to the visual input by spiking and sending their action potentials to neurons in the visual cortex, which is the main part of our model. Uh, so we're only modeling. Uh, uh, the input layer, layer 4C alpha, as I was saying before, as well as a little bit of uh, layer 6 in visual cortex, because visuals, uh, layer 6 is uh, one of the primary sources of feedback input into uh, layer 4C alpha. Um, and so we, we model just enough of layer 6 to approximate uh, feedback into layer 4C alpha. Uh, so those are the main components of the model. Uh, and now let's take a closer look at this. Uh, the visual input is a map uh, from spatial location X and Y and time T to a light intensity. Uh, so we can represent any black and white movie uh, with this function. Uh, now the LGN neurons see a local part of the visual field. So we can map all of them in the model to particular locations in the spatial domain of our uh, image or movie. Uh, so LGN neurons come in two different types, uh, on-center and off-center cells. The on-cells respond to increasing brightness and the off-cells respond to decreasing brightness. Uh, each LGN cell has a spatial kernel, which determines where in the image it reacts to. So let me put these up. Uh, uh, and it also has temporal kernel, which determines the time course of that response. Um, they're modeled as leaky uh, integrated fire equations, but you can think of on cells simply as spiking strongly when the light uh, is turned on at a location, and it becomes depressed when a light is turned off at a particular at, at its at the location oh. that it's seeing. So uh, it on cells is the exact opposite. Yeah. Sorry. No, just uh, I don't want to get lost. So um, no, just this integral. Uh, can you just two words about it? You you said, but uh, it was too fast. Oh, <laughs> I tried to make it small because I didn't want to uh, <laughs> okay. want want to focus on it too much. But uh, you, the the spatial kernel here in this integral a uh, is uh, is sort of uh, plotted and as a heat map here. And uh, it, it's uh, uh, the, the spatial kernel is saying uh, the, yeah. it, it, it's uh, uh, the information it tells you is uh, 
what part of the visual field uh, the LGN neuron re responds on. And so, so at each, uh, so in this part, you have a bunch of LGN neurons in your model, and that that's the equation with the eye. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's this different spatial kernel for each of these. So there's a spatial kernel located uh, at each of these spots. Yeah. So uh, the so in your model, each VI corresponds to a space mm -hmm. on the LGN. And okay. Okay. All right. Thank yeah, each, you. Each, each, LG, each LGN neuron is an integrated in fire model uh, with that mm -hmm. particular voltage. And uh, um, <clears throat> the light intensity map is. Uh, um, integrated against a spatial kernel and a temporal kernel to provide it uh, its input current to make it spike. But uh, for simplicity, you can just you can just think of uh, 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 an on cell as responding to an increasing brightness and an off cell as responding to a decrease in brightness. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, now moving on to uh, V one. Uh, I'll explain these markings here uh, uh, in a little bit, um, but all you need to know is that V1 consists of a grid of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So, so there's a square grid here of uh, uh, filling this uh, two-dimensional space of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And we'll call these, uh, these squares here are going to represent hypercolumns or pinwheels that we saw in the previous picture. Um, each of these hypercolumns represents a half millimeter by half millimeter um, region in uh, cortex. Uh, so in each one of these uh, hypercolumns, we place uh, 3,000 excitatory neurons, uh, 1,000 inhibitory neurons. And uh, we think of layer six as also being subdivided into these hypercolumns and sitting directly below uh, the um, uh, the um, 4C alpha neurons here. Um, and uh, there's about 300 of those projecting back to um, V1 providing feedback. Okay. Um, so here I, I want to uh, show the placement of the neurons in the model just to make it a little bit more concrete and real. So here, here I have the uh, V1 component of the model, in particular the 4C alpha layer. And I'm zooming into the central hypercolumn, half millimeter by half millimeter. And uh, the the, neuro the excitatory neurons in the model are, are placed as such. Uh, and there's uh, 3, 000, about 3,000 in there. And the I neurons are also placed in a square grid uh, inside this hypercolumn. And um, uh, layer six neurons are also um, placed directly underneath about 300 here. And um, <clears throat> we can also um, map the uh, LGN neurons to locations in cortex. So this is this this is this retina topic map where um, I'm not making any connections yet, but I'm uh, I'm mapping uh, LGN neurons to locations there in cortex as roughly corresponding to the same region of the visual field. Um, uh, so in this figure, uh, we see all of the neurons that are in the model. Uh, and in the next figure, we'll show how they're connected to one another. Uh, but first, I just want to point out uh, the striking change from LGN to cortex. Uh, so in a part of the visual field that uh, nine, say here, nine LGN cells cover, uh, in cortex, there are now thousands of cells. So there's a, there's a dramatic increase in the number of cells that are uh, looking at a particular region in the visual field uh, when you go to cortex. Um, um, so the, so those numbers, the, those Sorry. numbers that you show in your in your model are proportional to the real numbers. Um, so actually, in uh, re more recent data. Uh, we think that the uh, numbers should be a little bit higher, uh, but I, I don't think it really uh, changes things too much. And also, this is this is just one uh, this is one layer here, four C alpha and layer six as well. Uh, there's a lot. If you take all of the neurons in one hyper column going through all the layers, it's even more. 
Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so now what about the uh, connections? Here we'll see how all of those neurons are connected up. So first, let's take a look at the cortical. Uh, so here are samples of the cortical connectivities. In black, we have some post -synaptic. So on the left here in black, we have uh, some postsynaptic E cell. And in red are all of its excitatory inputs. Uh, similarly, uh, in black in this picture is an I cell. And we see all the E inputs to that cell. And in black, we have either an E or an I cell. The, the inhibitory inputs uh, look the same, and don't, uh, independent of whether you're an E or an I cell. Um, and we, we can also take a look at the, uh, what the feedback uh, inputs uh, look like. So some, some quick things to note here. The connections are radially symmetric in density. Uh, uh, the density is higher uh, near to a neuron, and it dies off with distance. Uh, so the, the cortical connectivity is completely homogeneous throughout. The connections are randomized, but other than that, V1 to V1 connections are not made specific. Uh, we, we don't handpick them to, to do anything. It's uh, like a Gaussian centered at the neuron. Yeah, it's it's Gaussian density. Although there's no there's no reason that that's that it should be Gaussian exactly. That's just something that we had to put in. Mm. So um, actual cortical connections. Uh, um, this is an ideal, and this is definitely idealized in some way. Uh, there's there's some things about uh, some data about cortical connections that we're we're not incorporating here. Um, so, but th th think of this as a uh, um, uh, kind of simple assumption for the the, uh, the um, connectivity to see and see if we can uh, see what we can obtain, see what kind of properties of V1 we can obtain with this, um, and uh, hopefully it's robust and it doesn't matter if we. Um, change this too much. So very simple assumptions on the connectivity here. Um, so <clears throat> now the so so this is very uh, homogeneous kind of connectivity within 4C alpha. Uh, when you go to the feed forward inputs, it's another story. So these connections are specific uh, and depend heavily on where uh, the receiving neuron is located. Um, so <clears throat> uh, Move this aside. One second. Um, uh, so this map to the left um, tells us precisely how we're going to choose uh, our. Uh, so I told you I was going to explain this map. Uh, this this map tells us how we're going to choose our uh, LGN inputs into the model. Uh, so actually, this this particular map. Uh, is a little bit outdated. Uh, there, there should only be four different uh, regions here, but uh, it, that, that's. Uh, but never mind. Uh, so, so the um, um, the picture here shows you um, uh, what kind of uh, what the LGN inputs look like for neurons as you uh, choose neurons around the pinwheel center of this hypercolon. So neurons on the left, just like this picture, here's where there's agreement. The neurons on the left here uh, pick uh, LGN neurons in uh, vertical stripes of uh, two on, uh, vertical stripes of on with a vertical stripe of off. Um, and there's more than one, there, there's multiple types of uh, LGN inputs, but th these are just simple ones to show for for our presentation purposes. Uh, so, and, and then as you go around here, you see the uh, orientation of the stripes uh, changes. So once you make it to the right side of the hyper column, now uh, neurons choose uh, LGN inputs in horizontal stripes. And, uh, okay. So, so this is going to be important for uh, obtaining these orientation preference maps here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, uh, here on the, this table on the uh, left, I'm showing uh, all of the uh, 
in degrees for the, the connectivity. Um, so something very striking here is that uh, uh, the, if, I, if I take a cortical neuron, the number of connections it's receiving from cortex is much larger than the number of connections it's receiving from uh, LGN input from feed forward. Um, uh, so, uh, right, one to six LGN uh, uh, excited uh, feed forward inputs compared to about 200 uh, cortical excitatory neurons. Uh, now, the LGN spikes will be about uh, will be stronger than excitatory uh, um, uh, other excitatory neurons, but only by a factor of two. And also, LGN won't spike much faster than other uh, cortical uh, e neurons uh, to make the difference. So we'll see that this makes a big difference. Uh, this matters a lot for um, uh, the dynamics that we'll see in, in cortex. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> now we've seen how the neurons are placed in the model and how they're connected. All that remains is to see how they act. So V1 neurons, both E and I, will follow a leaky integrated and fire equation as shown here. Uh, every neuron has a voltage V, a membrane potential, uh, and an excitatory inhibitory conductance, uh, GE and uh, GI. A high E conductance drives the membrane potential up to threshold, uh, and high I conductance drives it the opposite way. Uh, if the potential reaches a threshold of around one, then the neuron itself spikes. Uh, and uh, influences other neurons. And after it spikes, it resets uh, its voltage to zero for a short period of time called a refractory period. Uh, after that refractory period, it's free to move again. Now, the conductances depend uh, on the spiking of input neurons. Uh, when an input neuron spikes, uh, GE or GI increases by a fixed time course uh, multiplied by uh, synaptic weights. Right. So, so if I have uh, uh, input neurons, uh, neurons inputting to me uh, spiking, uh, those uh, spikes will increase my conductance by a particular uh, time course. Uh, two examples are shown here. Uh, so uh, if I have an excitatory neuron spiking here, I'll take the excitatory uh, time course, and that's what will be added to GE. And if I have an inhibitory neuron spiking, uh, uh, my GI will be uh, increased by these time by this uh, um, I time course here. Um, <clears throat> so if you've never seen this before, that's probably so too fast. So you could just think of it simply as follows: All neurons are either excitatory or inhibitory. When an excitatory neuron spikes, you get driven up to your spiking threshold. But if enough inhibitory neurons spike, you can be prevented from spiking yourself. Uh, and also, it takes time for E and I spikes to take effect on you. Uh, um, and lastly, the effect of uh, these terms here. It, it's just simply that if you are already near a threshold, uh, I spikes are stronger and E spikes are weaker. And if you're near rest, E spikes are stronger and I spikes are weaker. But that, that's, that's, uh, uh, if that's too much, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it's not so important. Um, so just remember, E neurons drive you up and I neurons drive you down. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now we're ready to see how the model responds to input. I'm skipping, uh, I should say, I'm skipping a very big thing that is parameter determination, which is a whole other big story, but I want to focus on the dynamics here um, uh, rather than that for, for this talk. Um, so the first thing to see how uh, the model responds uh, is uh, to a blank screen input. Uh, turns out that uh, LGN is supposed to fire quite a lot, even in this case. Uh, and intuitively, you can think of why that is, is because you want to see both positive and negative changes in brightness. So LGN must be at some positive uh, firing rate if you want to uh, detect, uh, you know, um, either the light intensity going down or up. Um, so now LGN in background, we call this background when it's when uh, um, 
when uh, we're stimulated by a gray screen input. Um, LGN will spike at about uh, 20 spikes per second. And they're, uh, and so here, here are example raster showing what that looks like. Um, now the response uh, V1 looks like this. Um, here are response rasters of V1 cells. Uh, now there's two different kinds of V1 cells called simple and complex cells that I didn't tell you about before, uh, but uh, I may get to them a little bit later. Uh, the main thing I want to point out is that V1 is uh, spiking in background, and there's a lot of variability in the firing rate. If you look at these different neurons, they behave very differently from each other. Um, a lot, there's a lot of variability compared to LGN, where everything is about the same. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, if I pull up uh, firing rate distributions in background, you can see that V1's uh, firing rate varies from zero to uh, even up to 20 spikes per second. Uh, so the cortex is not just following whatever LGM is doing. Uh, <clears throat> so an important uh, uh, observation to make here uh, is that when you look at the input currents to V1, uh, when they reach a steady state, is uh, uh, LGN only accounts for about uh, approximately 15% or so of the input current to V1. Uh, cells. It, it varies from cell to cell, but, it, but about 15%. Um, so although LGN provides initial drive, most input is from cortex. Uh, and, but further, if you silence LGN, then cortex itself is going to go silent. <clears throat> so okay. uh, now we'd like to see what happens when we visually drive cortex with a drifting gradient. Okay. What an LGN cell does, as you might expect, so, so think if I were to play a movie of this, you'd see these bars moving to the right. Uh, so what an LGN cell does, as you might expect, it is it goes on and off uh, as the grading passes by its receptive field. An on cell will turn on when the grading goes from black to white, and an off cell will do the opposite. Uh, either way, you can see they are all modulated by the grading. Uh, now, going to layer four, uh, Let's consider two uh, different neurons. Uh, suppose we're uh, 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 given a vertical grading as well, like in the picture here. Uh, now, the top neuron uh, has LGN inputs in vertical stripes, like so. Uh, and the bottom uh, neuron has horizontal stripes. So this is on the left side of the uh, um, pinwheel or hypercolumn, and this is on the right side. Um, so uh, what happens, uh, what, what does the input, uh, LGN input to this neuron look like in this neuron? Uh, so, so this neuron uh, is uh, um, going to get all of its LGN cells are um, uh, positioned in such a way that when given a vertical grading, uh, all of the LGN cells will be in phase with each other. So uh, um, so you can think about uh, a bunch of LGN cells here that are all uh, uh, aligned with each other. And when they add up, you get a big variation. You, know, you get a big barrage of spikes and quiet and a big barrage of spikes and quiet. Uh, and then this LGN neuron, uh, all of the phases are more spread out. So neurons on, in this area, in this part of visual cortex, are getting uh, highly modulated input, and neurons over here are getting uh, much more even input. And the effect uh, when you uh, uh, drive V1 neurons like this is that uh, cells and all of these uh, vertical regions here uh, are firing high, and the ones in the horizontal are firing off. Okay. And uh, in this slide, I'm showing you uh, what happens when you rotate the grid. Uh, you can see in the diagram at right, at right, as you go around the center of uh, hypercolumn, your orientation preference should move with it. Uh, and in the bottom figure, uh, we see that that is the case. We also have a video here uh, to see the firing rate uh, activity in time. <clears throat> 
you can see that the activity moves around quite a lot in time. Uh, it's not very smooth spatially. Um, <clears throat> Here the grating is rotating, and you can see the particular the region of cortex that stimulated is uh, moving along with it around the uh, hypercolumn um, center. And uh, lastly, I want to point out a nice uh, effect uh, that cortex has here. Uh, for these two grading orientations, there are no stripes that perfectly align uh, with them. Uh, so in fact, the, the, um, uh, all of the uh, LGN uh, inputs to neurons here are either uh, vertically oriented or 45 degrees. Uh, yet this is right in between, and it's, uh, uh, it drives the cortex um, um, pretty much the same. So uh, um, cortex is able to kind of average out uh, these um, different kinds of inputs. Okay. So here's a close look at the spiking of a handful of neurons in the center here. So here we, we've seen that uh, uh, cortex gets uh, um, driven in this region. And uh, here's what the spiking looks like uh, in that driven region. Um, so again, I wanna point out the big diversity in the firing rates here. Uh, you can see in the distribution of the firing rates uh, that the, the variance is very high. Um, <clears throat> And another thing I can show is the response of, uh, I selected uh, five different neurons here uh, in a, uh, they're all very near, uh, close by to each other. And uh, I'm um, plotting their uh, response over a range of uh, orientations uh, in, in these plots. And you can see that their response uh, to a range of uh, orientations, they're all fairly different from each other in their, how sharply they're peaked, uh, their average height uh, and uh, firing, uh, peak firing rate and uh, all of these qualities. And then this is also showing a, their, their response to a range of orientations and a range of uh, grading speeds as well. So they all respond uh, fairly differently from each other. Some of that is from differences in their LGN inputs, but also if you look at, uh, um, neurons with uh, very similar LGN inputs, uh, you can find find them, uh, find um, uh, that they're all, they vary quite a lot, um, um, even with the same uh, input LGN. Right. So um, if you zoom out, and look at hundreds of neurons uh, together, uh, you'll see something interesting uh, emerge in the spike ra uh, rasters. So the, this, this previous picture here is a very close up view at neurons and it's hiding something important. You don't see something that you see when you look at uh, neurons uh, uh, zoomed out here. Um, so Adi was, uh, if you might, you might remember in Adi's talk, um, uh, he was pointing out, uh, uh, this uh, uh, same phenomenon in uh, his model. Uh, here you see what uh, the phenomenon you see here is uh, repeating uh, events of coordinated uh, spiking activity here. And uh, in the past, Adi and Lysong studied these, uh, this kind of activity, and they called these multiple firing events or MFEs for short. Uh, and they're very prevalent in this model as well. Uh, so you can see in these spike uh, density plots here that only a small fraction of the E neurons participate in each one of these events. Uh, and so that, that's one reason why it's hard to spot in that in the previous picture. Uh, so when you look at only a handful of neurons, you don't see this so well, but it's only when you look at the uh, um, uh, um, larger collections of neurons that this kind of pops out. Um, uh, and um, 
yeah, if you study if you study the partic participation of neurons uh, in these events, almost all of the neurons participate in these events at some time. Uh, but neurons that participate together in one event don't necessarily stay together in events uh, uh, in which one of them is firing. Um, so uh, another thing you can do here is you can uh, count how quickly these events occur. And uh, you'll find here that there tend to be about 60 events every second of stimulation. Uh, but uh, it's far from being a periodic uh, phenomenon. The inner event times, the time between each of these events varies uh, highly. And sometimes the neurons are more uh, in a more synchronous state like here. Uh, and sometimes there are more asynchronous like here. Um, <clears throat> Now, this is all very consistent with a known property of the visual cortex when it's being driven, known as gamma rhythm. So if you take an extracellular recording from a visually driven part of cortex and look at its Fourier components, you'll find a similar wide bump roughly uh, in, in its uh, power spectrum uh, response. If you'll see a similar wide bump roughly in the order of uh, 60 hertz. Um, so I want to take a moment to show the uh, other similarities between gamma rhythm observed in data and what we have in the model here. Uh, so here, if I take the, uh, if you take a spectrogram of uh, the, the same uh, um, signal recorded from cortex, what you see is uh, that uh, gamma rhythm kind of comes and goes, and it has all kinds of different frequencies that it jumps around at. And, Kind of for free, without even putting this, trying to put this into the model, we get a very similar type of uh, uh, behavior here. Logan, is that for, yeah. from a single neuron, or? Oh, this is this is uh, so so from from data. This is uh, uh, LFP recordings, and uh, uh, the the. the um, kind of closest analog we can get to that is in the model. We we we'll, we take the uh, some spike density of the uh, neurons. So oh. uh, let's see. So the, this plot here, we histogram the the spikes, mm. and we get a time force here that's going up and down. Um, and we take a, a spectrogram of that time force. Okay, so it's the spectrogram of the figure B. Let's let's know. Yes. Okay. Yes. And. Uh, so it, it's showing the the gamma frequency kind of coming and going and changing uh, rate as well, very similarly to data. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's very similar to data is that you you find that uh, gamma rhythm is tuned with orientation. Uh, so that's something that we also uh, find in the model ourselves. So when uh, when a region of uh, cortex is optimally driven, it's strong gamma rhythm, but as you rotate the, the grating, uh, the amplitude uh, of, these, uh, of this rhythm decreases as well. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time here? Okay, I think I'm, I'm near the end. Uh, so the, the, um, the, one of the last things I wanna do here is, is I wanna, uh, um, similar to what Adi was doing, I want to show uh, the, the, that um, we can look at these multiple firing events and uh, um, get a sense for uh, um, their life cycle uh, here. So, so here, what I'm doing is I'm I'm looking at uh, a um, looking at rasters here, and I'm going to uh, um, pick out the uh, events. And take snapshots, snapshots along uh, different points in these events. And um, <clears throat> this picture was produced from doing this in a bit of a simpler model than the one we have here, um, but but it's uh, it, it's not very different. Um, so so what happens is uh, uh, here I'm looking here we're looking at uh, the voltage distribution in the model at different stages in time along a single event. And then we averaged them over many, many events. Uh, and you get a picture that looks like this. So, uh, so what happens in these multiple firing events is first the population is uh, set a little bit below threshold. 
And then either external drive or uh, firing events elsewhere in Cortex drives the um, voltages up. And some initial E spikes occur. And uh, E to E connections accelerate this spiking. And it drives both the E and I voltages up. And eventually enough I neurons uh, spike to drive both populations away from threshold. And uh, uh, that stops the event from occurring. So this is near the, near the end of the event. The I neurons have finally uh, um, um, caught up with the E neurons and stopped the event from happening. And then uh, after this has occurred, the inhibition uh, wears off and the voltage can re return to its starting level. And so this is what we see uh, um, uh, happening in, the, in these uh, events. Now, each individual event is a lot messier than this picture. Um, so this is giving a kind of rough average picture of, of uh, how these are occurring. Uh, but the real story of them is uh, probably a lot more complicated than that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, we find that uh, uh, gamma rhythm depends uh, strongly on the E and I synaptic time courses. Uh, so here in this uh, picture, we have the uh, kind of original model here. These are the these are how quickly uh, excitatory inhibitory spikes are felt um, by postsynaptic neurons. And if you modify these uh, um, uh, fast time course uh, um, um, properties of the system, it has a big effect on how, on this, uh, uh, these multiple firing events. So you can see, for example, that if you uh, slow down the I neurons uh, just by a little bit, then uh, all of these events become much, much stronger. And uh, similarly, if you slow down the uh, uh, excitatory time course just a little bit, then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the amplitude of these events go down uh, by quite a lot. So this is, uh, if you think about this uh, sequence of events here, when you slow down the E, the I's now have a, uh, the, the E buildup is a lot slower and the I's can jump in much more quickly and stop these events from happening and becoming larger. So, so, uh, we find that these are uh, important in uh, shaping the uh, gamma rhythm. Okay, and lastly, I just want to uh, show a snapshot of what, what does the current look like uh, to cells in the model. So one, one really striking thing that you see here um, is uh, when you take a cell, either it doesn't matter what kind, if you take one of these simple cells or one of these complex cells, and you look at its input current, um, uh, and you separate it into the excitatory and inhibitory input current, they're very closely uh, matched to each other. Um, and uh, you also see that the, the current is kind of going up and down at uh, um, roughly along with the, uh, at the same frequency of uh, gamma rhythm. And so it's, that's what you're seeing here is that uh, when you're looking at the input currents, you're seeing actually the gamma rhythm here. Um, and um, uh, and also, if you you break down the currents into um, currents coming from cortex versus LGN, uh, here you can see that uh, um, in uh, in all cases the the cortical current is much larger than the, the input current. So I just wanted to show that uh, here. Um, <clears throat> And also one other thing is that the I current slightly is slightly lags behind the, the E current. And this is something that you also see in, in experimental data uh, as well. Okay. So I just want to summarize all of these. Uh, uh, this kind of a whirlwind tour through all of through through parts of the aspects of the model here. Uh, and I just want to give a kind of quick summary of, of some of the things that we've seen. So um, so the, the first thing to remember is that from retina and LGN to V1, there's a ex sudden explosion in the number of neurons corresponding to 
uh, a part of the visual field. Uh, now, there's a high diversity in the responses of these neurons to visual stimuli. And uh, um, uh, the, the second thing is that current driving cortical neurons is dominated by inputs from within the local network rather than feed forward or feedback input. Uh, excitation and inhibition from the local network are roughly in balance. And also cortex dynamically reaches this state. So we didn't uh, kind of, uh, um, choose the number of connections or anything like that to uh, make this happen. Um, the last thing is that gamma rhythm is, so gamma rhythm is something that's ubiquitous in, in cortex and experimental data on it is consistent with the phenomenon of, of MFEs. So, the, so MFEs and uh, uh, MFEs uh, uh, are uh, there are robust emergent property in networks of excitatory inhibitory neurons, and they just they, we're we're kind of lucky that they are uh, so strikingly consistent with gamma rhythm. So it's a, it's it seems like a, a very likely uh, uh, candidate for what is behind gamma rhythm. Um, so, and, and some of the characteristics to remember about uh, these MFEs are that there's something in between periodic and asynchronous activity, um, and that they consist of coordinated spiking events, and they, they each involve a very small fraction of the population, um, and uh, uh, there's, there's patterns in, in uh, how these uh, uh, events evolve in time. So they, you can break them down into kind of a life cycle. And uh, in different parts of this, uh, in different stages of these events, uh, particular parts of the model dominate in the evolution of that event. And so you can kind of control the uh, how these events progress by uh, looking at uh, um, uh, these particular parameters. Um, and there's a need to understand it better mathematically and quantitatively. Um, so and lastly, I just want to say that detailed models like this one are well suited to studying some particular phenomenon in the brain like gamma rhythm, because spike timing and synaptic dynamics matter for studying these things. So you can ask why, why not just kind of build a rate model of all of this? Uh, well, in order to uh, study some of the, a lot of the things that we want to study involve um, synaptic dynamics and spike timing and things like that. Uh, so you kind of have to build one of these uh, a detailed model like this to get into things like that. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention and uh, open the floor for any questions.